Thank you.
Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. See that you refuse not him that speaketh, for if they escape not who refused him that spake on the earth, much more shall not we escape if we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. We look at this uh, scripture this morning, and, and the David Jeremiah commentary tells us, as after Abel was killed by Cain, his blood cried out to God for judgment, declaring Cain's guilt. This was found in, in Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. But Christ's blood, on the other hand, accomplished our forgiveness. His blood cries out that his followers are innocent of sin. This, thus it speaks of better things than, than Abel's blood. And, and this morning, I, I just I felt like led to go in this direction that the, we need to be reminded this morning of better things. We've got better things in Jesus than we have in this world. We've got better things in Christ 
than we have in this world. This world, it has no hope. This world it is, is going to face an abrupt end one of these days. But we have a hope that goes far better than anything that we could ever see or, or, or have or desire in this life. Our hope goes beyond the grave. Our hope goes beyond this mortal existence, and it goes with eternity with God uh, in Jesus Christ, who speaks from heaven. His blood has made us to be able to be partakers of life. His blood, his blood has made us to be able that we can fellowship with the Father and we can have the baptism of the Spirit. We can have the Spirit operating inside of us, and, and we have this through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, one never knows sometimes what a week will bring, do we? Uh, sometimes it's good things, sometimes it's bad things. And uh, as this world grows stranger by the day, I mean, it, it's, I feel like I, uh, I was, me and Wayne was riding the other day. We uh, was went up to, to quote a job and, and we were riding and talking about it. I said, you know, it's strange to me. I feel like a stranger in this world. I, I, I drive by places I've seen all my life, and, and I love to see the beauty of, of the earth and the, the trees and the, 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 the fields and the mountains and all the things that you see going down the road, you know. Uh, and all of that that you see, it, it, it looks a lot of the same. My memory goes back to when I was a kid, but this world has changed. This world is different. This world is not the place that I grew up in. This world, there's a, there's a darkness, there's a forebodingness, there's a heaviness on this world that ought to let the child of God know that Jesus is about ready to come back. And that's the exciting part for us as Christians. But th this world is, is not home anymore. This world is, is a strange place. This world is not uh, something that I, I look forward to or get excited about. But Jesus is. I get excited about him. And I'm thankful for that this morning. When we look and see that this, this as the world grows stranger, we look and see that uh, we got to remember that Christ is our Redeemer. He's our Savior. He's our Lord. He's our Master. He's our soon coming King. We've got to look up and stop looking down all the time. Sometimes it's, it's easy to look down, but we've got to start looking up because Jesus is getting ready to come back. I believe the church has been looking down for too long, you know. We've got the woe is me's and the oh me and the oh my's and, the, and we got all the things the world has, but it's time for us to realize that we have been promised better things. We've got a hope. We've got a future. Regardless of what happens to America Amen. or regardless what happens to the world, it does not matter. We have a hope that is secure and is steadfast and will be there through all Amen. our generations. If we'll just hold on to the nail-scarred hand of Jesus, we're going to make it. Yeah. Uh, 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 this Jesus told us, he said in John 14 and 27, he said, peace. He says, I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. We, we walk in this world. We, we've been given a gift that we can walk. Uh, uh, it kind of goes along with the, the Sunday school lesson this morning that, that we can walk and not fear. Psalm 91, we can walk in, in, in God's light and God's power. Though everything comes against us, God will walk with us. God will protect us. God will keep us. And we're going to be his for all eternity. But I wanted to start this morning. There, there's two things I want to share with you. The ways of the world and then better things. So I just kind of broke it down that way this morning into two points instead of three this morning sometimes. Sometimes it's easier, sometimes it's not. But this morning, the first thing I want to look at this morning is the ways of the world. This is what the world has to hope for. This is all the world has if anybody doesn't put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, this is what they're left with. That's what I want to talk about first this morning, the ways of the world. The first thought I want to have for you is slavery. We find in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 11, and then I'm going to skip down to 13 through 14. It says, Now there arose up a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, 
Let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and it come to pass that when there falls out any war, they join also our, 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 unto our enemies and fight against us. And so get them up out of the land. Therefore, they did set over them taskmaster, taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Pythium and Ramesses. And he, the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Uh, here we see that the, the slavery, uh, the ways of the world are found in Egypt. Uh, the world today is looking for ways that they would enslave people. You know, you might not think so. You might not believe it, but... Uh, we know that the communism, socialism, they have ensnared many around the world today. We look at, see dictators, that they'll live in extreme luxury while their citizens live in abject poverty. We see that's, that's the slavery that the world desires. That's what the world has, is slavery. You know, you wonder why. You look back and, you know, we know our history was slavery in America. And you wonder why all oh, that, that happened. But it's nothing new. It's been from the beginning of the world. The world wants to enslave people. The world wants to treat people, wants to rule over people. That's exactly what the devil wants to do with people's lives. He wants to rule over them, lord over them. He wants to be their master. But only those that come to Christ Jesus can be set free of the slavery of this world. But that's what this world desires. We, we see it uh, in, in, those, in those countries that, of Marxists and socialists and communists, uh, any opposition to those powers are, are met with imprisonments or even sometimes death, uh, even in our own country. You look at us this morning, and, and don't be don't be shocked this morning. Uh, but we are living in times where our freedoms are slipping out from underneath our feet, uh, even as we speak. Uh, it's slipping out of the people's hands, uh, and it's slipping back into those that want to, to control everything that our lives entail. They want to control everything we do. They want to control everything we eat, everything we buy, every place we go. They want to control that. Why? Why is that? It is a demonic spirit of control. That is part of the world. They want to control. They want to reign. They want to rule. It's the same thing as Satan had from the beginning. His desire was to, to rule and to lord and to be over God. He wanted to be over all of the, you know, he offers in, in, the, in the wilderness, he offered God. He said, I, I will give you all the cities and all the glory of the world if you would bow down to me and serve me. That's all he wants. And so he can't do anything but create slavery and bondage situations because he wants to lord over people's lives. That's what the world has. That's what the world offers. That's all the devil's going to give you. You know, he may offer you a, a glimpse of, a, you know, and this is how he entices people. He entices people to say, oh, look, we're going to give you this. We're going to give you that. We're going to take care of uh, uh, all your needs and all you want. And, it, and then when you get trapped in by the cheese, you're just like a rat. You're dead. You know, it's that quick. That's all the things, all the glorious promises, everything that looks good. They even speak, even today, I, I, I've never seen a day in an hour where I've seen so many lies spoke I, and people fall for it left and right. You know, our nation is on the verge of, of collapsing. Our nation is, is this, this is how critical I think our, our election is this year. And, 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 you know, it's all in God's hands. I, I can't worry about it. You can't worry about it. All we got to do is put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're, we're in a mess, I tell you. We're in a place where we're looking at people that want to, 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 to take away the word of God. They want to take away our rights. They want to take away uh, uh, people's guns. That, this is where we're at. And don't think it's not that far away. It is. It really is. But I believe that Jesus is going to help us no matter what we face. 
no matter what we go through, but I'm here to tell you this morning, that's the way of the world. The entrapment, the enslavement, that's what they desire. They want to enslave people. The second thing is in the world, what the world has is misdirected worship. We find in 1 Kings chapter 16 and, and verses 30 through 33, it says that Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the, the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebai. And then he took a, a, to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians. And he went and he served Baal and he worshipped him. Then he reared up an altar for, for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove. And Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Wickedness, adulterous, ungodly, perverted. I, I look at this. When Israel was separated into two kingdoms after Solomon's death, the northern kingdom never had a king who would turn their hearts back to the Lord. But the southern kingdom, on the other hand, however, would fall into a pattern of serving the Lord and forgetting him. Uh, mirroring, mirroring an image, I guess, the best way I could describe it is, is the mirror the image of an EKG. It was up and down, up and down. They'd serve the Lord, then they'd stop serving the Lord. It was up and down. Eventually, both would face the judgment of God for not serving the one true God. Across our globe today, we see that there's many nations who pursue the gods of this world. Think about this. They, they, they worship their images, their idols, the materialism, the notions. They even follow pop culture or popular culture instead of the Lord Jesus Christ. They speak diversity and inclusion, yet they do not want to hear about the God of the Bible. This is where we are today. This is exactly the place that we're in. And the main reason is if Jesus Christ is included in the mix of all other little gods, his superiority, his majesty, his power, his holiness, his love, and his faithfulness and his truth will outshine all the rest of them. If Christ was included in all the religions and all the deities of this world, Sooner or later, somebody would point out that God in, in Christ Jesus is far better than anything else the world can come up with. And, and that's why they don't want him. They don't want it. He's the opposite of what they are. They're fake. They're fallible. They're made up. But he's the real. He's the true. He's the, he's the God of heaven. Uh, amen. This is, the, this is where we're at today. Think about this. The, the Pew Research Center says this. There's more than 80 countries who favor a specific religion, either as an official government endorsed religion by affording one religion or by affording one religion preferential treatment over the faith. According to a new research, Pew Research Center analysis, of data covering 199 countries and territories around the world, Islam is the most common government-endorsed faith. Think about that. Islam, with 27 countries, including most in the Middle East and Northern Africa, officials enshrining Islam as their state religion by comparison. There are just 13 countries, including nine European nations, that designate Christianity or a particular Christian denomination as their state religion. But additional 40 governments around the globe, globe unofficially favor a particular religion. In most cases, the preferred faith is a brand of Christianity. Indeed, Christian churches receive preferential treatment and more countries, 28, than any other unofficial but favored faith. And would you believe it or not that the, in the Pew Research Center, America was not listed as a Christian nation? Isn't that, does it should surprise us? It shouldn't, I guess, but it, 
It's, shock, it's shocking to think there's been more Bibles printed here. There's been more messages printed here. There's been more gospel released uh, around the world through the America. And yet, here we are. We don't profess to be a Christian nation no longer. We want to be open to all religions. And that's exactly what Ahab really did uh, to, his, to his world to, to his, in his day. Ahab opened the floodgates to everything going and coming, put them on the same platform as uh, Almighty God, Yahweh, as Dave was teaching about this morning. He, he put them all on the same platform when God is above everything. He is to be worshipped. He is to be praised. He is to be honored. He is to be exalted because only God can do what we need done in these bodies. Now, these things in this world and any man can't help you. Any any stone or piece of wood, it can't help you. Any idol you set before you, it can't help you. But there's one who went to the cross of Calvary that I could live. There's one who died in my place so that I might could have life. Jesus is his name. <clears throat> that misdirected worship. Help us this morning. Help us, oh God. I believe it's even gotten into churches. They don't know who to worship anymore. When they can fly a rainbow flag in the church, and there's a lot of Christians uh, that are so mixed up, they, 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 they think that you can endorse both or embrace both, but you cannot. You can only embrace the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. The questioning of truth. Here's another story out of the Bible that lets us know what the world has to offer. In John chapter 18, when Jesus stood before Pilate, verse 37, Pilate said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered and said, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born. And for this cause came I into the world that I should bear witness of the truth. Everyone that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went again, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find no fault in him at all. And it amaz it's amazing to me that the world hasn't changed over all these years, has it? They're still questioning what truth is. When Pilate asks what is truth, he, he then proceeds to walk out and speak to the Jews. He, he, he leaves an open-ended question like, what is truth? It, it was more of a, instead of a question, it was more of a statement. It was, what is truth? And we find in David Jeremiah commentary, it states Pilate's question reflected the cynicism of the day and actually ours. Skeptics were teaching that truth is unknowable. There is a matter, it's a matter of opinion. So if such a, a thing as absolute truth existed, there would be no way to know it. Ironically, he said the answer to Pilate's question, truth was standing in front of him. Think about it. That's what this world questions. They question what truth is. They say, oh, you, you know, what's true for you is not true for me. You know, and, and that's that's the world we're living in today. You know, we, we can go around it all day long and we have science to back us up if they would, but they don't do that anymore. And we can tell people that there's only a male and a female and that's it. And we can preach that, we can teach that, and we know that to be fact. It is truth. It is truth. It's also, it comes from God's word. But the world doesn't hear that anymore. The, the world wants to say that it's more than that. The world wants to change all sorts of manner of things that, that, that are imagined in the brain, that they're not real, they're imaginary. But they say that's truth to them. But there's only one truth, truth source, and that's in the Lord. That's in God, in God's word we find this morning. People today, they're living in the imaginations of their own mind. Common sense is gone. Intelligence is gone. 
All, all, all through the word of God, it gives us undeniable instructions for living and presents truth. The world, like Pilate, they walk away with no rebuttal. They have no th nothing to say. They can't speak against it. They have not one thing that they can tell us that Jesus isn't real. They can't do it. They can't say that the God of heaven, the God of, that has created all things and gives all truth, they can't say that he's not real. They can't do it. They can, they, can, they can talk about it all they want to. They can deny it all they want to, but the evidence is clear. The evidence is clear even into your heart, into my heart. The evidence is clear that there was a day that you and I came to the Lord Jesus and we felt the presence of the Lord and he come to us in, in, in his word and we came and we asked the Lord to forgive us of our sins and we felt the burden of sin lift. We felt the forgiveness that came down from the Father. We felt the love of God like nothing you've ever experienced in your life. I, I feel his presence. I, I feel his touch. I hear his voice. I know know that my God is living and, and you know I'm, I've never heard God's voice audible I've never heard him speak in my ears but I have felt him speak down in my soul and I know the Lord's voice I know I hear his voice I know that he's real and just as importantly as I, I told you for those that, that haven't received the baptism of the, of the Holy Ghost I, I knew when I received the baptism of the Holy Ghost that it was the most amazing thing it was like I knew that I knew that I knew that Jesus was real. There was a reality. There was an empowerment that I could not deny that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God. It was I knew that I knew that I knew that he was real and he was alive and he was it was all not just something made up. And after I received the Holy Ghost, you know, there, you know, beforehand, I can remember, uh, I was 14 when I first received the Holy Ghost, but I can remember beforehand, I can remember the devil saying, well, that's not real. Question this, question that. No, you're not sure of this. You're not unsure of that. You don't know about that. What about this? Constantly bombarding, wondering, am I really saved? Am I really changed? Am I really fit for heaven? Am I really going to make it? Is it all this that my mom and dad taught me and the preachers I heard preach? Is it all real? But when I come to the place of receiving the baptism of the Spirit, it was an assurance like no other. It was a calm like no other. It was a peace like no other, other that came over my soul. And I knew that God was real. I knew that Christ was my redeemer, my savior. And there was nothing that could cause me to doubt. This world is threatening. The last point I want to make for this this morning, the world is threatening. I won't read this all for constraints of time this morning, but Acts chapter 4, we find that... Uh, the apostles of Peter and John, you know, that they had healed the man at the, 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 the gate called Beautiful. And they were brought in to be threatened. Don't you preach or teach in Jesus' name anymore. We thought we got rid of this. We thought we killed your Messiah, Jesus. He, he was dead. No, they, they all came up with their excuses of probably where he was. But they, they said, he's alive. Amen. Yeah. We've seen him. Hallelujah. They might have thought the disciples stole him, but said, there's no way we could have got him. Uh, do you wouldn't have paid off probably the Roman soldiers that were there that day. But I, I'm here to tell you, they said, he's alive. This same Jesus that you killed, this same Jesus that you were the one that put him on the cross and we laid him in the ground, but we have seen him alive. We have seen him with our eyes. We have heard him uh, with our, our ears. Uh, we have touched him. We know that he's alive. This is the same Jesus that you're talking about. And they're like, we don't want to hear that anymore. And here we are. When truth cannot be disputed, that leaves the world with nothing to do but threaten. We see that on the increase, do we not? While it's a commonplace in socialist and Marxist countries, it's just being beginning to be waged here in America. 
oddly enough, think about this. This fight is taking place among our youth, in our school systems, in our college campuses, around the nation. That's where they are threatened to be silent about Jesus. Don't you wear your Christian apparel here. Don't you show your faith in any way here. You can't carry the Bible to class. You can't carry the word of God on this campus. Don't you show who you believe in. Don't you remark on who you are. This is where there is war that is being waged on our children and they need our prayers. Not just that. I saw something that it's kind of scary. We've talked about it. We've seen it. We understand it to some degree. But it's much worse than that. These devices that we have, they're not good for us old folks sometimes, you know. But they were talking about how that I saw this, this uh, study this group had done. They talked about how that the phone and the iPads we're causing our children to not even be able to be able to socialize. To not be able to function without a device. And once that, you think about the thought of that. What is so scary about that? The thought is this, is that the one that can't do without will be controlled. Think about it. If those, if those young people cannot do be walk you know live a life without an iPad or an iPhone or uh, some electronic device, if they cannot live a life and can't, they can't speak, they can't communicate, then they are entrapped. Again, it goes back to enslavement. They've got them enslaved. They've got them entrapped. They're bringing up a whole generation that's going to be a, just ripe, if you will. For the Antichrist to bring them in. God help us to win souls. Help us to win young people. Help us to win uh, our youth back from this devil's uh, game of entrapment. Uh, it's not. It's okay. Like I said, you got to use it for a tool. You got to use it for what it is. I understand that. Uh, I use this for a tool. It, it works good. Uh, I don't have to print out paper. I can read it off of the screen. It, it works out great for that. I don't, I don't have to buy so much ink and all that. You can use it for a tool. But when it's got to the place where it entraps you, it enslaves you, and it controls you, that's where we're heading. With the Antichrist spirit. Better things this morning. Let's get to better things. Amen. In Christ Jesus we have better things. We know the truth. Jesus said to those in John chapter 8. He said if you continue in my word. Then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. I'm glad this morning. We, you might ask this morning. How are we free? Uh, we are free from the bondage of sin, first and foremost. Amen. We are free from the guilt and the shame that it, sin brings. We're free. We don't have to walk in shame. We don't have to walk with the guilt. We don't have to walk with the burden. We are set free by the love of Jesus Christ. We're set free. Uh, freedom. We're free from lies. We know the truth. We're free from lies. We're free from deception. We've been set free. We know the truth. Uh, and it sets us free. Uh, we're free from any propaganda the devil may throw our way. We, it doesn't matter what he says. We know the the truth is in Christ. We know that we've been blood bought. We know that we have been uh, brought into his kingdom. We know that we are alive and well in Jesus today. And all the lies that he wants to spill cannot overcome us and overtake us. Jesus prayed in, in, in John 17 and 17. He said, sanctify them through Thy truth, thy word is truth. We need the word in us to break, keep bringing the truth, keep breaking the bondage, keep breaking the yokes, keep helping us to keep able to hear the Lord's voice. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. We know when he speaks, he speaks through his word. He speaks to our hearts. He'll speak to us through his word. We need that. We need him this morning. He gives us truth. 
He gives us life this morning. John 10 and 10 tells us the thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Uh, we've got life this morning. Amen. Where would you be without Jesus? Where would you be without his peace? Where would you be without his knowledge? Where would you be without his presence? Where would you be without his joy? Where would you be without the happiness of the Lord that makes you shout, that makes you sing, that makes you praise him? What would you do, what would you do without the presence of the Lord when you can't cry? Uh, there's times that I cry that's sad. There's times that I cry that it's just the presence of the Lord that comes down and ministers to my soul. I, I thank God for his presence. I thank God that he ministers to my soul. Where would we be without him this morning? In Acts chapter 17, it tells us in verse 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands as though he need anything. Seeing he gives to all life and breath and all things. For in him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of our poets have said, for we are also his offspring. We live, we move, we have our being this morning in Christ Jesus. Everything that we enjoy in life is because of him. It's not us. It's not this life. It's not this world we're in. It's not even the, the nation we're in. It's not the state we're in. But everything that we have that is of enjoyment is because of him. 1 John 5 and 11 tells us, And this is the record that God hath given us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. And he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. We've got better things this morning, don't we? We've got life this morning. What is life? If you might ask this morning, in my mind, some things may be living, but they're not fully alive. Right? Have you ever watched a flower without water? You know what happens? Hey, we had a prime example up here, didn't we? Boy, that piece of lily's gone now, but you remember you come in, it didn't have no water for a while. What did it do? It drooped over the basket. The leaves touched the ground. It was alive, wasn't it? It was still living, but it was drooping. But when Christ comes in, when Christ comes into our life, it, he makes us alive. We're not drooping over. We're not dragging our tracks out. We're not woe is me. Should, we shouldn't be. Amen. Amen. If, if we're woe is me, we need to tell the devil it's time for you to get off. Get out of our mind. Leave us alone. We are victorious through Christ Jesus. We are a winner. Uh, either way, we're going to win and realize we've got life. You know, you look at another example that came to my mind is, you know, a bird could be living in a cage, could right? It can live in a cage. But what fun is that? That's exactly what Christ did. He broke the prison chains that bound us. He set us free. That, that we don't have to live in bondage. We don't have to live in fears. We don't have to live in, in the things that try to bind us. We're set free from those things. Here are the words of Jesus that he read in the temple concerning himself. He read from Isaiah 61 and 1, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he, the Lord hath anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. He has set us free. He has given us life. He has given us a life that we could not have, could not have even imagined what God can do for us. Even to this day, I believe, I don't know that all of us really realize what, what life God has given to us. What, what we can do with the life that we have in Christ Jesus. 
Jesus is the good news. He heals. He sets free. He breaks the bondage of those that are in shackles of sin that has placed upon them. And we look at this. The last thing I want to look at is worship. The world has a misdirected worship, don't they? Man, they'll worship a hunk of stone, right? And it, it seems, you know, thank God for Jesus. Amen. That's all I can say. But, you know, if, and if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have my right mind. Right? Yeah. I, I believe that. I believe that common sense and all the, the, the right thinking and in the way of truth and all those things, all of them are in me because Christ is in me. If I lost my Jesus, I, I'd lose my mind. You hear what I'm saying? I'm, I'm not talking about I wouldn't be in a state of, you know, like from a disease or whatnot, that sort of thing. I'm talking about I would go off in who knows what direction. Like what we see in the world today. But because of Christ, I have my mind. Hebrews 20, 12, 27 says, And this word yet once more signifies the removing of those things that are shaken. As of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. There's only one thing that cannot be shaken. That is the kingdom of God. Everything in this world is going to be sh shaken. It's going to be shook. It's going to be rocked to its core, in other words. It's going to be brought low. It's going to be brought down. It's going to end. It's going to stop. It's going to cease. It's going to end at, at some point. But there's one thing that will not end. That's the kingdom of God this morning. We look and see, it says, Wherefore, we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. It cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably and reverence with godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. As Christians, we have the kingdom of God which cannot be shaken. Its foundation is built on the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Of which all uh, all will bow one day. One day, one everybody on this earth, everybody that's lived on this earth, is going to fall down and worship Jesus. One of these days, the Bible tells us. It, it says in Philippians, it says, "Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name." That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, that leaves no place for the human soul to run from, does it not? Under the earth, in, above the earth, wherever, every knee is going to bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What a day that's going to be. I long for that day. I, I get excited about that day. You know, I believe that's sometimes what we as Christians, we have to do. We, we live in a world that's, that, that's dark. We live in a world that's troublesome. We live in a world that's, that's mixed up. And we live in a world that's constantly bombarding our eyes and our ears with gloom and doom and despair. We got to realize that one of these days, everybody's going to bow before the Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's the picture that should be in our eyes and in our spirit this morning. So when the world, I believe, looks dark and foreboding and the waters look rough and troubled and you feel like you're overwhelmed by this world's winds that are, are, are flying against us, we need to look up. Jesus has better things than what the world offers. Amen. Jesus has better things. Yes. His blood made it possible that we could experience better things. The resurrection made it possible that we could experience better things. All because of what Jesus did for us. I'll leave you with this verse this morning. We find it over in Psalm. This is Psalm 95 and 6. It says, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Let us worship Him this morning. He gives us better things. Amen.